It's a wonderful blessing to be here with you this morning. I hope that you feel uh, the same way, uplifted and edified by being here thus far, singing these songs together, coming around the Lord's table, praying together. Uh, all of these are, are a tremendous blessing. And we're going to take this time now to study a portion of God's Word together. And we're going to continue a series uh, that we've been looking at over the last couple of months on a case for the inspiration of the Bible. And so today and then Wednesday, we're going to wrap that series up. Um, and so looking forward to the study with you this morning. Today's topic specifically is, is the Bible's message true? And that's ultimately the crux of what we want to decide as we're looking at this issue as a, a case for the inspiration of the Bible. We've looked at a lot of different evidences, a lot of different things. And at some point, we have to make the decision, is the message that the Bible presents, is it true or is it false? Is it real or is it not? And so the goal of this study this morning is, is to look at some things related to the message of the Scriptures that I think can, can show us, in addition to all the things that we've looked at, that it truly is the Word of God and the message within it is powerful. So this is the roadmap of what we've looked at thus far. We talked in part one about the textual reliability of Scripture and the manuscript evidence that exists um, that shows that the Bible has been accurately translated into English and transferred to this century to us, and we can rely uh, on what it is that it says to know that it's an accurate reading. We talked in part two about prophecy and the fact that the Bible contains about 25% of it is prophetic at the time in which it was written. And so that's a huge piece of evidence to us to show if the Bible truly is predicting futuristic events, and we've shown some of those, then that's powerful evidence of the inspiration of the Scripture. We talked in part three about science. And the science that the scripture portrays and that it knew before man knew it and all of those wonderful aspects, it, it explains who we are and where we came from in a way that other mainstream ideas just don't and don't have the evidence backing. And then in part four, we talked about the historical and archaeology uh, and archaeological finds that, that support the evidence of the scripture and that the scripture is accurate. It's a, it's a historical record that's accurate and genuine and archaeology supports that. And so today we're going to look at the inward part of the scripture, the message, and we're going to talk about whether or not we can evaluate that message to be true. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible makes a claim that the word of God is powerful. That it makes an impact. And you'll visit with Christians. If you're a Christian here this morning, then you have probably shared your testimony and the power of Christ and the power of God's Word in your life with others. And you visit with Christians and you hear that. You hear about the great and wonderful ways in which their lives have been changed by the Word of God. And so if you're in this crowd this morning and you're wondering, can I believe the message of the Bible? Is it true? One of those things that we need to look at and that I think it's interesting to look at is... Is there evidence to show that the message of the Scripture is consistent, is genuine, and is powerful and life-changing in the lives of those that believe it? And I believe the answer to that is yes. So this study is going to show, I think, what this verse talks about, the power of the message of the Word of God. As we move forward, I want you to know that the message that's contained in the Scripture is one that's consistent. And I want to remind you of something that we talked about all the way back in part one. And that is that the Bible is not one book. The Bible is a library of books. It's 66 different books put together. It, is, uh, it was written over a span of over 1,500 years by 40-plus authors. Uh, it was, those authors came from various walks of life. It was written in three different languages. It was written in different places across three different continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Its writers wrote under different circumstances, some in good times, some in bad times. Its writers had different purposes for writing, whether it was to encourage Israel to get right with God, or it was to encourage the New Testament church, or to share the gospel of Jesus, or to chronicle the early church. All of these different books had different purposes behind the writing, but what we see is a consistent theme and a consistent message throughout. And I want to share some of that consistent, consistency with you this morning. So I want you to think about this idea of creation that we've talked about. The Bible explains who we are and where we came from, and that God created us. But these 40 different authors over 1,500 years in three different continents in three different languages with different purposes, they didn't disagree about the concept of God creating everything. In fact, they agreed. All of them teach that same consistent message. Moses wrote in Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. John wrote in John 1 verse 3, All things were made by Him. 
Mark 10, verse 6 quoted Jesus. Mark did by saying, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And we could go on and on and on with writers from different books that talk about the creation story. And we want to recognize that this is not something that writers disagreed about. These 66 books of the Bible, they agree. They all tell the same story about God creating everything, the universe, the world that we see around us, and ultimately you and I. But not only creation, but ultimately what happened as a result of being created, and that was that sin entered into existence. And so in Genesis chapter 3, you have the story of Adam and Eve partaking of that fruit that they were told not to. They sinned against God, and they're punished from that. And what we see is all of these 40 different authors over 1,500 years, etc., all tell that same story about sin and the consequences of sin. Moses wrote in Genesis 3, 24, So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. They were separated from God because of their sin. What does Isaiah say about sin? In 59 and verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The same consequence in a different way, but it's the result of sin. We're separated from God when we sin. Paul wrote in Romans 5 verse 12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The reality is, the consistent message of the Scripture is that God created everything, concluding with you and I, and that we brought sin into our own lives, and each one of us do that. And when we bring sin into our own lives, when we disobey the things of God, we're separated from Him. And that message is not contradicted anywhere in that story. But amazingly, despite our sin and our choice to rebel against God, the message is also that God has provided a way of redemption, a way of salvation. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah is talking about a sacrifice for sin a Savior, a Messiah that God was going to send on behalf of His people, of you and I, to take the payment for our sins upon Himself. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, For He hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Paul's confirming exactly what Isaiah wrote was going to happen, that Jesus came and did that. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, Who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live in a righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. I just want us to think about the concept here as as this message uh, through the scriptures is being presented by these 40 different authors, that if God is not a unifying theme behind these authors, if he is not inspiring the words that they are writing, why wouldn't any of these authors have gone off track and said there was some other way that we're going to be saved? It's going to happen some other way. But yet they all agree on that sacrifice that was going to be made for our sin and for our redemption. Not only that, but Jesus, in being that sacrifice and redemption, we're told throughout the scriptures that something spectacular was going to happen. And that he was going to be raised from the grave. And in part two, we talked about the resurrection and evidences of the resurrection. External writings that show the empty tomb was there and it existed. And logic and reason to show that it's interesting that Christianity started there in Jerusalem where if Jesus really was dead and never came back to life, all they would have had to go, do was say, his body's right there, guys. It's all fake. But they couldn't do that because something spectacular happened and Jesus was raised from the grave. And that was foretold in Psalm 16, verse 10. David wrote, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Speaking of Jesus, that Messiah, that Savior. John quoted Jesus as saying, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. In John 2, verse 19, and he wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his body. Jesus' body was going to be buried for three days, but he was going to rise back up. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. That's exactly what we see happened. And none of these 40 different authors of any of these 66 books ever dispute or disagree or tell a different story about Jesus or about that Savior and Messiah. We're also told throughout the Scriptures as a part of this consistent message that Jesus, that Savior, that Messiah, who would be raised from the grave, that He would eventually come back to claim His own, to provide eternal life for those that were a part of His family. In Matthew 25, verse 31, Matthew wrote, quoting Jesus, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, that there's going to be a time when Jesus says, I'm coming back. 
John quoted Jesus in John 14, verse 3, saying, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is saying, I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'm coming back. I'm going to claim my own. I'm going to bring my family with me. And Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of, an archa- of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that same consistent story is told book after book after book that Jesus, this Messiah, this Savior who paid the cost of our sins on that cross and was raised up from the grave, that one day he will return. And that you and I, if we're a part of his family, will go and live forever in heaven with him. And then finally, we look at the consistent theme and we see this message of eternity and of judgment. Matthew quoted Jesus in Matthew 25, verse 46, as saying, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And what we see is that in Scripture we're taught that there are two eternal destinations. One is called heaven, the other is called hell. One is a place of reward and life for eternity. The other is a place of destruction and death for eternity. And there are two choices And Jesus talked about that in Matthew 25. The writer of Hebrews talked about that in Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's coming back, and we're going to face that judgment day. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now I go through all of these things related to the message of the Scriptures for two reasons. One, because if we're going to evaluate whether or not the message of the Bible is true, I want us to have an understanding, at least in basic sense, of what that message is. And what we've just gone through in these verses, that's the basic story and message that the Bible tells, that God created everything. He started it all, that mankind rebelled against him in sin, but that God in his grace, love, and mercy provided a sacrifice for that sin. That's his son, Jesus, that Jesus died on that cross and paid the penalty for our sins. But he didn't stay in the grave. He also conquered death and rose from the grave three days later. And that one day he's coming back to claim his own. And when we approach that day of judgment for eternity, there's one of two places that we're going to go. And that's dependent upon whether or not we have accepted the gospel and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the message of the scriptures. And it's consistent throughout all of these writers and all of this span of time and and these languages and these places and the purposes and all of those things that we've talked about, that's what we see. And I just want to ask you this. If we took 10 contemporary writers and asked them to provide their thoughts on any subject, pick the subject, pick religion, pick Jesus... Pick any of those things that we've even talked about. Creation, the start of man, any of that. Give them any one topic. Would all ten of those writers write the same thing? Would they write messages that were all 100% in agreement and consistent? No. You know that's not true. You would have ten very different viewpoints on any issue. And yet what we see is that 40 men or 40 authors from three continents with various backgrounds under different circumstances in three languages in a span of over 1,500 years, wrote 66 books addressing hundreds of subjects, and not once was that common theme and message of the Scripture contradicted. And to me, that's powerful. It's a powerful way to understand that these weren't just people writing their thoughts about messages or about politics or about religion or about whatever the current event of the day was. These were people that were inspired by God, by a single author, to write a powerful, life-changing message. John R. W. Stott, in Understanding the Bible, said, There is indeed a wide variety of human authors and themes in the Bible, yet behind these there lies a single divine author with a single unifying theme. And that's what I think that we see with this. So layer one of the message this morning is that we need to understand what that message is. Layer two is we need to understand that it's consistent And it is throughout all of those books. And then layer number three that we need to understand is that the message that's in the Scripture that we just talked about, it's life-changing. It makes a difference in people's lives. People who turn to Christ and they live for Christ, they are different people than they were before. There is a tangible, observable difference that you can see in their life when they give themselves over to Christ. I think there's a reason for that. The reason is it's not fake. It's not false. It's real, and the impact is real. The power is real, and I want to show you that 
in this part of the message. And we're going to start in Acts chapter 6 and talk about a man named Stephen. You may be familiar with Stephen. Stephen in Acts chapter 6 was one of seven men that was put over uh, serving the church and the physical needs that they had there. I believe he's one of the first deacons that was ordained in the church. The apostle said, we don't want to We don't need to leave the study of the scripture and teaching of the scripture in order to serve tables and make sure people are getting food and those things. So we're going to appoint seven men to do that, or the people are going to appoint seven men to do that, that are full of the Holy Ghost and honest and of good report and all those things. So Stephen's one of those guys that was a good man, a good godly man, and he's out there, and he's talking to people about Jesus and discussing Jesus with people. And there are those folks that he visited with that could not resist the wisdom with which he spoke, and they didn't like that. And so they began to look for ways to silence Stephen. In Acts chapter 6, verse 9, it says, There arose certain of the synagogue, which was called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. And so they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They paid people, essentially, to falsely accuse Stephen of things he wasn't doing. And they're saying, He's blaspheming against Moses. Now, Stephen's teaching Jesus... He's teaching new covenant, he's teaching new law, but they're saying he's blaspheming against Moses and the old law and against God. And so they're stirring up the people in Acts 6 and verse 12. They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Then said the high priest, are these things so? So I want you to put yourself in Stephen's place for just a moment. He's out there teaching Jesus. He's trying to influence people, impact people because of the change that has taken place within him. And so these evil thinking and spirited people that don't like what it is that he's teaching, they take him and they bring him before the Sanhedrin council and they pay off people to say false things about him. And then the high priest looks down at him and he says, is this true what they're saying? Now, this is Stephen's opportunity, right? If it's not real, if it's not genuine, if it hasn't really changed Stephen's life to that degree, this is his opportunity. He can say, you know what? I was wrong. Didn't mean it. I got caught up in something. I'm out of it now. Forgive what I said. I want to live. But that's not what he did. Read Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, he gives what sometimes we term a defense. It's not really a defense. It's more of an indictment against the Jews. He talks about time and time again where prophets were sent to tell the Jews the will of God. And time and time again, the Jews turned against him. And he concludes that message in Acts chapter 7 by saying this, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers. Now that's not a way to walk away with your life. That's not a way to say, hey, this Jesus thing, it was just a fad. It's not real. I want to make it out of here alive. That's somebody talking who truly believes what it is that he's saying. His life has been impacted and changed to such a degree that he's going to look at these men who have his life in their hands and he's going to say, Time and time again, the Jews didn't listen when God sent people. And now you're not listening. You took the Son of God and you killed Him. You're not listening. You betrayed Him. You murdered Him. It did not have the impact of changing their life in that moment. Instead, they reacted in anger. And when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on Him with their teeth. But He, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so as Jesus, or as, as Stephen rather, provides this indictment against that council that day, and they get angry, and they rush at him, and they grab him, and they drag him outside the city. And one by one, they begin picking up stones off the ground, and they begin throwing them as hard as they can at this man. This man who was teaching Jesus, who was begging and pleading for them to think about what they had done to Jesus, and they're throwing stones at him. And as they're doing that, he looks up 
before they stone him, he looks up. One of the things that also made them angry that's, that's fascinating and it's powerful to me is that he looks up into heaven and it's like a door into heaven opens up and he sees Jesus. And Jesus is standing there at the right hand of God. And this is the only place in Scripture that talks about Jesus standing at the right hand of God instead of sitting at the right hand of God. And it's almost as if Stephen, this man whose life had been changed, it's powerful, it means something to him. He's not going to walk away and pretend it's false, but he's going to stand there and believe and stand up for the truth that he knows is true, that God gives him this vision and this ability to see Jesus as if he is standing up, welcoming him because he knows what's about to take place. And that gives Stephen, I'm sure, a boost of faith and strength to endure what's about to come. And they drag him and they begin to stone him. And even while they are stoning him, these men are killing him. He looks at them and he prays and he says, lay not this sin to their charge. And that reminds me of Jesus on the cross. As he looked down at the men who had nailed those nails, he looked out at the people who had crucified him and he said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And here's a man whose life had been changed, had been impacted by the word of God, had been impacted by Jesus. It wasn't false. It wasn't fake to him. It wasn't a fad. It was real. And he went to his death for it. That's a message that's life-changing. And it's powerful. But you know, Stephen wasn't the only one. And some critic or skeptic of the Bible could say, yes, but that's a Bible story. If we don't believe the Bible, then the story of Stephen may not even be true. So how are we going to be moved by that? I want you to know that Stephen wasn't the only one. In fact, Christians began to face a lot of persecution. And history records some of the persecution that takes place. And I want to talk to you a little bit about some of that that took place in the first century. Under the emperor of Rome named Nero. He ruled from 54 to 68 AD. And I want to, I want to tell you about what happened in 64 AD, if you're unfamiliar. In 64 AD, there was a great fire that got started in the city of Rome. And it destroyed a good portion of Rome. Now, a lot of people blamed Nero himself for starting that fire, and honestly, it's likely that Nero did. It didn't help that after the fire had wiped out a certain section that he tore it all down and he built palaces and things for himself after that. So it, it kind of looked like Nero did start the fire, and so the people of Rome are blaming their emperor for starting this fire. And so what Nero decides to do is to shift the blame away from himself and on to the no-good Christian people that he didn't like and didn't care about, and he decides to blame them for that fire. And so Cornelius Tacitus, we've talked about him, he's a Roman historian, he says this, consequently to get rid of the report that he had started the fire of Rome, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. So here's your group of Christians in the first century who were 20 years, 30 years removed from Jesus dying on the cross, Christianity is still very, very early on. And they're trying to survive in a, in a heathenistic world. And suddenly you've got the emperor of Rome, the most powerful nation in the world, now that has put all of his focus on blaming you for something that you didn't do. And so Nero begins to take Christians and to torture them and to put them to death. Tacitus says this, Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty, then upon the, guilty... And then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. See, these folks weren't guilty of firing the city. They were guilty of being Christians. And so they began to force confessions and coerce confessions of being Christians out of people. And if you confess being a Christian, then you were taken and tortured and put to death. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Now, I don't want to just read over that. I want you to pay attention to the atrocities that are being committed against people and put yourself in that place. You're a Christian in the first century. You had no part of firing the city of Rome. You had no part of that. But suddenly Rome is against you and you've got soldiers that are walking up and asking, are you a Christian? What are you going to say? Yes or no? Is it real for you? Has it changed your life? Has it impacted you to such a degree that you're going to stand there and say, yes, I am. And then when you're taken by those soldiers and you're dragged and you're fed to dogs or you're nailed to crosses or you're set on fire, are you going to be able to stand there and say, I'm a Christian? Yes. That's what they did. And we don't have reports of masses of Christians that changed their mind and said, 
It was all false. It was all fake. You know what we have? Christians that went to their death for this. Because it was real. It was powerful. It was life-changing. It impacted them to that degree. Tacitus goes on and says, Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. Now, Tacitus, we've talked about hostile witnesses, right? And throughout this series, we've used a lot of hostile witnesses. These people aren't trying to defend Christianity, and Tacitus isn't either. He says they're criminals. Yeah, punish them. Exemplary punishment. But even Tacitus is going, it doesn't seem like they did anything worthy of this. It seems like cruelty. And that's what it was. And it was Nero being cruel towards this group of Christians. And yet these Christians took it. and They lived for Christ. And they died for Christ. Because it was real. It was life-changing. It was impactful. I want to tell you about some other people throughout history. And my point in, in talking about some more recent folks is not that I know everything about the doctrinal beliefs about these people. That is not my point. My point is that throughout the last 2,000 years, there have been people willing to die for their belief in Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you about a few. It's a man named Jim Elliott who lived in the 19. 50s. He was a missionary, and that's what his life's work was. That's what he wanted to do. And so he went to South America, to Ecuador, and specifically to work with the Quechua Indians. But while they were there, they realized that the Quechua Indians often had hostile conflicts with another tribe known as the Akas. And so he and four others decided that while they were there, they also wanted to try and evangelize the Aka Indians and share the message of Jesus with them despite their violent and vicious reputation. And so they began to fly over the areas where they knew the Akas lived, and they began to, to uh, lower baskets with gifts and things for the people, and, and to, through a speakerphone, to speak a message of peace and all of that thing, to try to make some friendly contact. And eventually they set up camp near an Aka village, and there were some of the tribal soldiers that came out and greeted them, and they thought they had made friendly contact until those soldiers went back, got more, and they came back and they massacred Jim Elliott and his missionary friends on the beach that day in January 8, 1956, for going and trying to spread the message of Jesus to people that are out there that need it. His journal was found, and it's October 28, 1949, he had written something in his journal that I thought was powerful. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. That's an impact. That's life-changing. This man believed to the point where he said, if I have to give my life for it, I'm, I'm willing to do it. That's a life-changing message. There's another man I want to introduce you to named Wang Zeming. In 1973, Wang was a Christian leader in Wuding County, China. And during the Cultural Revolution, Wuding became a focal point of attacks on religion. Wang this man was declared a counter-revolutionary and was made an object of criticism by the government, the Chinese government. But despite that pressure, Wang refused to compromise his belief in Christ or comply with orders that went against his faith. He is quoted as saying, My hands have baptized many converts and should not be used for sinfulness. Twenty-one Christian leaders, among them Wang Ziming, were imprisoned in Wuding between 1969 and 1973. And after those four years of being imprisoned, Wang was sentenced to death and executed in front of more than 10,000 people at a mass rally in 1973. And not once did he say, just kidding, it's not real for me. It was real for him. It was life-changing to him that he was willing to stand up against an oppressive government who eventually put him to death and say, I believe this and I'm not going against it. I introduce you to somebody else named Rahid Ghani in 2007. Rakib Ghani was born in 1972 in Iraq. After studying in Rome, Father Ghani requested to be sent back to Iraq to serve his country as a Catholic priest. In 2007, after an evening service at their church, he and three deacons were approached by a group of men. Ghani was told to shut down the church, to which he responded, how can I close the house of God? Ghani and the three deacons were told to convert to Islam or die. They each refused. They were then shot, and their bodies were placed in a car full of explosives so that if anyone attempted to remove the bodies, they would be destroyed. 
Hours later, the police bomb squad disabled the bombs, the bodies were recovered, and thousands attended their funerals. Again, my point is not doctrine and every, all the ins and outs of what these guys believed. My point is the message was life-changing enough to where when they're faced with a convert to Islam or die question, they go, I'm not doing it. And they died for it. One more. Shabazz Bati in 2011. In 2008, Bati was appointed federal minister for minority affairs, becoming the only Christian in the Pakistani government. At the time, he said that he'd accepted the post for the sake of the oppressed, the downtrodden, and marginalized of Pakistan. Now, he began receiving death threats after voicing his support for Pakistani Christians who were being persecuted and put to death for the faith. Knowing that he could be killed, he recorded a video ahead of time and said, I believe in Jesus Christ who has given his own life for us, and I am ready to die for a cause. Bati was assassinated on his way to work on March 2nd, 2011. The group uh, Tariq e Taliban said they carried out the attack because Bati was a known blasphemer of Islam. Folks, there have been people throughout the last 2,000 years that have been given their lives for the message that's contained in the scripture, and it's still happening today. And we are very blessed in this country, and sometimes we don't recognize and realize the challenges that Christian people, that believers throughout the world face in these other countries that aren't as friendly to Christianity or to freedom of religion. But every day there are Christians that are persecuted and put to death. In fact, according to the 2023 World Watch List report released by Open Doors International, last year in 2022, 312 million Christians experienced high levels of persecution in the countries on the world watch list. Those are essentially 50 countries that are the most hostile to Christians. And in those countries, 312 million Christians face persecution every day. This represents one in seven Christian people worldwide, believers in Christ worldwide. North Korea, just as a side note, is ranked number one and has been for the past 20, 21 years of being the most hostile towards Christianity. 5,621 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons, 15 every day. 4,542 Christians were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. 2,110 churches or Christian buildings were attacked. And these are only the reported numbers. In fact, the actual numbers are likely much higher. What we fail to understand sometimes in our wonderfully blessed country and time that we live in is that persecution against Christ and against believers in Christ still happens, and it's happening right now. And there are people that are going to their death, and they're willingly being persecuted and thrown in prison and dying because what they believe is real to them. It has changed their life to such a degree that they are willing to endure that because of their hope in eternity. What does the message of the Bible mean to you? Have you been impacted by it to that degree? Or are we willing to look at all of the people throughout time that have been willing to give their life for it and just go, it's all fake. I'm going to tell you about the group of apostles in the first century. These are the men, many of whom wrote most of the books of the New Testament that we have. And these men who were the first ones really to carry the torch of Christ out into the world after he ascended back up to the Father, it would be very interesting to see what these men did, right? Because if they made it all up and Jesus was never really resurrected from the grave and it wasn't real, these men at some point should have given it all up. And yet what we find is that these men all gave their lives, however long their lives lasted, to the cause of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you about some of them and remind you of some of them. Philip was scourged and crucified for his faith in Jesus Christ. Bartholomew was beaten and then crucified for his faith in Jesus Christ. Thomas, you know, we think about Thomas. We heard a a sermon about Thomas recently, but what do we think of when we think of Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Thomas, who had to see the imprint of the nails and see the the, the side of Jesus that had been torn by that spear. And when he did, he said, I believe. Thomas was killed with a spear for his faith. He wasn't doubting anymore. He went to his death for Jesus. Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, was a tax collector, looked down upon by a lot of people. He went out and preached and lived his faith and was axed to death with a halberd. It's a battle axe was beaten to death 
and axed to death. James, the son of Alphaeus, was clubbed to death at the age of 94. He lived a good long life, but at 94, you know what he was still doing? He was still preaching and teaching Jesus, and it led to his death. Thaddeus was crucified for his faith. Matthias, who replaced Judas as one of the apostles, he was stoned and beheaded for his faith. Simon was crucified because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Andrew, what do you think about when you hear the name Andrew? Andrew doesn't have a lot of speaking parts in Scripture, does he? But Andrew did something pretty spectacular. He went and grabbed his brother. He said, you've got to go meet this guy, Jesus. And he brought Peter to Jesus. And then Peter was able to preach that first gospel sermon to thousands and thousands of people and become an elder in the church and all those things. Andrew was the guy that introduced him. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross because of his faith. James, the son of Zebedee, we see this story in Acts chapter 12. Herod began to terrorize the church, and he took James and he beheaded him. He died for his faith. John, what you might call the, the best friend of Jesus, or so he, he seems to claim in his book, the Gospel of John, the disciple who Jesus loved. John, who was there for so many big, amazing moments. John was the only apostle to escape a violent death. He was exiled to the island of Patmos. And eventually, uh, eventually, I believe that he came back and worked with the church in Ephesus and some other places uh, and eventually died. He's the only apostle that, according to records, we don't have that was martyred. Peter. Peter's the guy that a lot of people seem to identify with. Peter's the one that reached for that sword to defend Jesus. And he cut off the, the, the high priest's servant's ear. Jesus said, put your sword away. That's not what this is about. Peter's the guy that saw Jesus walking on water and said, let me come out and walk on water too. And he started doing it. And what a powerful, inspiring moment till he began to look around. And then he started to sink and needed Jesus to save him. Peter is the guy who denied Jesus three times as Jesus is hanging there on that cross. He's going through his trial and his persecution and crucifixion. Peter's the one that said, I don't know him. But Peter's also the one that stepped up in front of thousands of people and said, Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And he became an elder in the church and wrote books of the New Testament. Peter was crucified upside down. And he requested that because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same manner that Jesus was. And so they turned him upside down and crucified him that way. Paul. Paul, who became an apostle later, after persecuting the church, terrorizing Christians because he thought that was right, his life was changed when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he became a Christian. And he became an evangelist, an apostle. And he established churches and encouraged churches. And went around preaching the gospel of the lost to people that needed to hear it. He wrote about half the New Testament that we have today. Paul was eventually taken, put in prison, and beheaded by a sword for his faith. Here's the point, guys. If this stuff wasn't real, if it wasn't life-changing, if it wasn't powerful, why would these men have gone to those deaths? Why wouldn't at some point they have said, we made it all up? But I'm telling you, I believe the message of the Scriptures. I believe it's real. Not only because of the external evidences and all the things that point to the fact that it's real, but because the message is consistent and it's life-changing. And that's what we see over and over and over again. And though I've not been asked to give my life, it's been life-changing to me. And for those of you that are Christians in this room, I hope it's been life-changing for you. Because the message of the Scriptures has that power. Pascal, a French philosopher and mathematician, said, I prefer to believe those writers who get their throats cut for what they write. And that's just the bottom line. If somebody's willing to go to their death for it, it's likely they truly, truly believe it. Now I want to take the other side of the coin. Let's say you're a, you're a skeptic of all this. Here's the argument. Willingness to die for a belief does not make that belief true. You know what? They're right. 
Just because we believe something is true doesn't make it true. True isn't relative, right? Truth is truth regardless. So just because somebody believes in something doesn't make it true. There were terrorists who flew planes into the building on 9-11 who believed that that action of sacrificing them th- themselves while murdering lots of innocent people would gain them eternal life and the rewards of eternal life according to their religion. They believed that. And they were willing to die for that. Does that make it true? No, it doesn't. In the 1970s, there was a man named Jim Jones who convinced over 900 people to move to South America with him, live on a compound with him, and eventually drink Kool-Aid, or actually it was Flavor-Aid, that was laced with cyanide as a counter-revolutionary statement against the man. And hundreds of people were murdered, essentially, by Jim Jones on that day, but went along with him because they believed him. He swindled them. And they believed it. So belief in something doesn't necessarily make it true. I'll give you that. But people generally don't die for belief. They know to be false. So let's consider that. If you know something's false and not true, are you going to die for it? If those terrorists that flew the planes into the buildings on 9-11, if they knew that all of that was false and they weren't going to gain eternal life, but they were going to spend eternity in hell for the actions that they took that day, would they have still signed up? If those 900 people that moved to to Jamestown in South America, if they knew that Jim Jones was a liar, a cheat, and a fraud, would they have still gone with him? The reality is, we don't tend to go to great lengths for something or someone that we know is false and not real. And so at the very least, we can acknowledge, and all of us should be able to acknowledge, the apostles believed that it was true. They knew in their mind it was true. They did not believe or know or have any knowledge that it was possibly even false. So at the very least, we've got to acknowledge they didn't fake anything. They didn't lie about it. They believed to the core that this stuff was true. And I want us to consider that there's a difference between believing in something and seeing it with your own eyes. And that's what the apostles had the ability to do. You see, you and I, we believe, we have faith, we walk out on faith. The apostles saw it. They saw the miracles. They saw Jesus hanging in there on the cross. And they saw Jesus resurrected from the grave. So what did they witness firsthand that kept them resolute in their faith in Jesus even until death? Ultimately, I think it boils down to this. They saw Jesus, the Son of God, alive when he should have been dead. And they knew at that moment that everything that he had taught them throughout those three years and him hanging on the cross and all of that was real because they saw him alive when they shouldn't have. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17 says, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. You know what Paul's point was? We're being persecuted. We're being put to death. If we can only have confidence in Christ in this life, if it's not real, if Christ wasn't really raised from the grave, if we really don't have a home in heaven someday, we're the most miserable people on the planet. And why in the world would we sign up for that? But the reason that we preach what we do and we live what we do is because we know it's real. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that He was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that He was seen of James and then of all the apostles, and last of all He was seen also of me as of one born out of due time. Paul describes all the different people that this resurrected Jesus appears to. And in the midst of that is 500 people that Jesus appeared to at one time. And somebody says, well, Paul could just be making that up. Again, we're using Scripture to try to prove Scripture. But you know what Paul says? If you don't believe me, go talk to him. Most of them are still alive right now. Go talk to the 500 people that Jesus appeared to and ask to them if it happened. It happened. And so the question becomes, did those 500 people, did they all lie about it? They all make it up? Well, if they did, they volunteered for torture and signed their own death warrants. And that makes no logical sense. You and I both know people don't do that. Did they all hallucinate? That's been a theory thrown around by skeptics. Maybe they all hallucinated seeing Jesus all at once? The same hallucination? I don't know if you know this about hallucinations, but they're not group experiences. They're a lot like dreams. Never woken up and been like, that's a great dream we had last night, right? Doesn't happen. It's an individual occurrence. That's hallucination. 500 people didn't hallucinate him. So what does that leave us with? 500 people saw him. They saw Jesus, a man that should have been dead. And there he was in front of them. 
That's life-changing. And so if you're among that crowd, you're going to give your life and your death to that man who should have been dead and is not. Because you have realized the impact that if everything else that Jesus taught was true, you've got to be in his family. So that when you do die from this earth, you've got a home in heaven waiting for you. And that's what they did. So as we conclude this morning, I hope we've illustrated that the message of the Bible is consistent and it's powerful. And it's life-changing. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 22, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And I want you to know that this morning, that this message of the scriptures, this powerful, life-changing, consistent message that Jesus is resurrected from the grave and he is offering salvation to any who will come to him and eternal life awaits those that are a part of Jesus' family, that message is for you. Paul said, we're doing this, we're teaching this, we're living this because it happened. And I think we can have confidence that it happened because nobody stood up and said, just kidding. And regular human beings wouldn't do that unless it was true and it was real. And I believe that. Our last passage of the morning will be 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. Paul said, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that Stephen was willing to go to his death, and Christians throughout the last 2,000 years were willing to go to their deaths, and the 12 apostles were willing to go to their deaths, is because Jesus conquered death. And Christians don't have to fear death anymore. And I want you to know you don't have to fear death if you're a part of Jesus' family. And so as we wrap up our talk this morning and we've asked the question, is the Bible's message true? I want to tell you where I stand very plainly and very clearly. I believe the answer is yes. It's true. The evidence shows that. The impact and life-changing power that it holds in other people's life shows that. The life-changing power that it has had in my life shows me that. And the same thing could be true for you. So if you're here this morning and you're not a member of Christ's body, that is the most important decision that you can make to start your walk with Jesus. And be promised that eternal life in heaven with him. If you're here and we can help you with any other need, we ask also that you'd come to the front as we stand and sing.